There's a place I have found in the shade on the ground, far from all worries and troubling sound. When I go there to be by myself, only me. No one can guess what I came there to see. There's a sun in the sky. There's a cloud drifting by. All kinds of birds make you wish you could fly. And in the distance, I see someone waving at me. I hope that it's you, but who else could it be? Hey, good morning. It's Monday morning here at Untold Radio Network Studios. Uh, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. We've got a few people jumping in already. Um, got a couple things I was going to talk about right away. Uh, and we will get to those in just a moment. It's been a beautiful weekend up here. Um, we had a little bit of rain. But for the most part, um, up in northern Minnesota, it's looking pretty. Uh, all the everything's starting to green up. Had to get the mower out. <laughs> Had to ride the my my. I I have a yellow cub cadet. I affectionately refer to as my hog because I don't have a Harley Davidson. So I ride my hog around the yard and and do a little mowing and. It was nice. I mean, it feels like summer again when you smell that cut grass and riding around on the mower. Um, had the boat out a few times, got the dock in, got the boat lifts in. Um, it feels like we finally put uh, winter behind us here, which took forever. <laughs> but one of the things I wanted to cover and mention right out of the gate is uh, most people are aware of the Legend Meet Science 2 Kickstarter that was done. Um, and I wanted to pop that up. Let me get that here. So right now, I mean, they, they had some aggressive goals. D uh, Doug and his team, uh, they set the goal at $80,000 to be able to complete the second part of the Legend Meet Science 2 uh, deal, and they've been working hard at it. Uh, $80,000 goal. They're at about twenty five, just under $25,000 now with 191 different people backing it. I got to tell you, though, if you back it for the minimal amount, uh, if you just come in right now and back it for the, for, uh, well, I shouldn't say the minimal amount. I think it's $30 you get the part one and part two of the documentary. So basically you're just pre-purchasing it. And I would encourage people to think about doing that. Um, I will put the Kickstarter uh, link in the comments of the show here uh, once we're done with the show. But uh, when you click the link, you can click back this project for $10, you get your name in the credits, <laughs> but for $30, you can pre-order the part. You get the part one and part two, and you get your name in the credits. And I'll tell you what, um, if you were going to buy it anyway, let's just do it now. Let's get this thing to its goal so that it can get made, and I would encourage everybody to do so. Um, but uh, I'm excited. I am really excited at what they come up with. Uh, uh, putting out to everybody. I think everybody's going to love this thing. I can remember how monumental in the early 2000s uh, the first Legend Meet Science was to this community, and it's going to be that much impact and more uh, with this one. So I would encourage people to get involved with that. Uh, the other thing is, is my book was released, and I've got some friends that have ordered it, and I, I tell you, it's so humbling. Uh, when people tell me, hey, I ordered your book, or the sh they sent me pictures of them holding it. Um, I really appreciate it, and uh, appreciate that support. 
Um, I understand that times are tight. Budgets are budgets and bills need to get paid. Um, this certainly wasn't uh, an endeavor on my part to really go out and try to make money. I mean, I've told people and people who have wrote books uh, know this. Uh, we're not talking about this isn't something that's probably going to sell a million copies, obviously. But, you know, when you go out and you release something like this, I'm doing it not only to share my encounter, which is basically the first half of the book, but the second half of the book talks about the work that I did in research a year and a half ago and where I'd like to go with my research. And I think that's kind of cutting edge. It's a little bit different. And it, uh, hopefully you find it interesting. I've had some good reviews back on people's thoughts on it, and I appreciate that. But uh, that's available on Amazon. You can search The Pine Island Incident on Amazon, or you can go to hangeronepublishing.com um, and find it there. So, yeah, I, I uh, just wanted to let people know that I that I encourage everybody to get involved with the kickstart uh, for Legend Meet Science 2. Let me pull up what else we've got here this morning to talk about. Um, and then I will bring in here, I'm going to bring in Leon, Bigfoot Okanagan, friend of mine, somebody I wrote about in the book a little bit. Hey, Leon, how are you doing? Ah, well, it's kind of early for me, but uh, I'm trying to wake up. I just realized, oh my God, I'm, we're having coffee time and I'm just about done my coffee. <laughs> I didn't get a chance to go get another coffee while you were talking earlier. So. You were, so for those who don't know, I mean, Leon is uh, one of our friendly neighbors uh, from Canada <laughs> and lives out on the extreme Western part of North America. And uh, so it's early there. I, I get it. And when I asked you to be on the show, you, you said, well, what if I'm not there right when it starts? I said, you can hit the snooze button once or twice, but just don't stand me up. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I appreciate you coming on. Um, normally, I have on one of the hosts from Untold, you know, one of the other hosts. We've kind of gone through that whole cycle. A few of them have been on twice. But we've also kind of ran into that time of year with so many uh, conferences going on, people speaking at conferences, availability is a little bit tough. And I thought, you know what? I'd really like to maybe open that parameter up and get some people in to coming on the show here uh, as a guest that has something interesting to talk about from this community. I typically, with my show, kind of stay in the corner of the room with this sasquatch subject but untold as a network looks at different areas of the paranormal and maybe at some point we'll get in some guests that have more experience in that area too but um definitely wanted to get you on we're going to be talking a little bit later in the show about uh a conference that you're going to be speaking at and some things uh that i think people will find interesting uh, just a, as a, a note, too, if my mic is screwy for people in the audience to let Jeff know, I'll get off my mic. I just tried to reprogram it the other day there, and I've been fading in and out, I guess, so I can just go back on my other uh, mic. So, And if I'm loud enough, hopefully I'm loud enough, too. I'm not too soft. <laughs> it's not, It sounds good right now. Um, okay. So, And let me just go into the to, – Edit mic settings real quick here. There we go. All right. So I tell you, usually I talk about, uh, we usually start the show with some different videos and things that I just kind of stumble across in the news. And, you know, we always try to keep it positive, upbeat, and funny stuff. But I I read this this thing the other day have you ever you know what these orbies are they're like little balls that are like silicone type yes. little things yeah, yeah. well there's this there's this challenge that people have of filling up a tub yeah. with orbies and stuff this guy filled up his tub with orbies 
and afterwards didn't know what to do with them. So he pulled the drain. Oh, no. And they swelled oh, up no. and blew all the plumbing out, it, not only in his apartment, but every apartment in the whole complex. The toilets, the sinks, the all the plumbing was blown out from these doing the Orbeez challenge. So <laughs> I, I would... I would rethink whether or not somebody's planning on doing that. It doesn't look like a real great idea. But. Not to mention the lawsuit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine. You know, this is probably something that his renter's insurance isn't going to cover. I mean, he's going to be selling his car and everything else trying to trying to cover that. But let's see here. Okay, well, then I also have... This, this is an interesting video, and the reason why I found it interesting is because it reminded me of something that happened to me about 10 years ago. But so this guy's planting his yard, you know, and he's got this rubber made deal full of grass seed and different types of seed. And this is a yearling buck that evidently found it with the cover up. <laughs> Help yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Look at you. <laughs> hmm? Yeah, he likes the seed enough that he doesn't just leave. He actually just comes right back up and starts eating some more. <laughs> it, uh, it made me remember some things that had happened in the past. But I'm curious, Lynn, have you ever had any experience with, you know, wildlife that maybe gets a little too comfortable around, you know, humans and civilization, so to speak? Well, I've had stuff like that happen to me. I remember one time I was sitting next to a lake by myself and this duck was out in the middle of the lake and the duck swam right over to where I was. And I'm thinking, this is kind of weird. And then it swam in front of me and then it looked up at me and it came up on shore and sat right beside me. And I thought, this is weird. <laughs> you know? It's like those it's guys like that are hunting turkey. And, yeah, or the, the guys who are hunting are tree standing in a tur and a shirt tur for turkey hunting for turkeys and the turkey comes up and lands on their gun and they're standing there looking at the turkey with them on the gun kind of thing i don't know there's a part of wildlife if they i i think if they're unfamiliar with you be humans being as a threat they don't see us as a threat and they come out kind of come out and hang out with you for a bit and i've had i had a fox one time when i was working in forestry we had a fox that was on the block the fox looked like it lost one of its legs in a trap and so it was having a hard time getting food. So it started to come into the, well, we noticed it came into the uh, uh, bus that we would take the crew up into the forest with. And we'd go through and eat that. So we started to leave it snacks. And then it would start hiding all the all the food in different parts of block. And I don't know if it, how we would remember it, I guess, from smell or whatever. But it was stashing it. And uh, I don't know if it made it in the, in the long run, but at least we, we tried our best to assist it <laughs> with its health thing. <laughs> and then we had crows that were, uh, crows used to recognize us as food sources, especially for tree planters. So they would always come around and go through, people would go back to their main cache where the trees were. And of course, that's where the lunch bags are. That the, the crows have learned to lift the white tarp up, <laughs> look inside of the box, go inside. <laughs> grab everybody's food and then you just hear people pissed off during the day like ah, they're stupid you know they they stole my yeah. peanut butter jam sandwich they stole my this so they were pretty smart that's for sure it's like once they discover a system you know then oh, yeah. they just keep implementing it over and over um well what that video reminded me of is i you know living similar to you in an area where it gets pretty darn cold and whatnot in the winter and a lot of times these animals get to where they're really, you know, come the end of winter, they're really starting to get in dire straits, figuring out where they're getting their next meal from. And uh, it was warming up one year, 
it, it wouldn't say it was spring yet, but you know, the, the snow is melting and our electric garage door opener one night, I must've just forgot to shut it. And that's not usually good around here. And I had a whole bag of grass seed in the garage and the next, that, that night, um, my wife had heard something clank out in the garage and she went out and stuck her head out the house into the garage and looked and a shovel that had been leaning against the wall was now knocked over. And I thought, well, that's not going to just fall over on its own. Something knocked this thing over. And so right away, I'm starting to get this sick feeling in my stomach, like what's in our garage now? And I had a live animal trap. So I put some peanut butter in this live animal trap uh, and set it out there. And we're inside. I shut the garage door at that point. We're inside. And I hear that thing snap shut about an hour later. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, what have I caught in this thing? You know, I mean, we've got everything around here when it comes to animals that would fit in that. And I'm just thinking to myself, just don't let it be a skunk. You know, I mean, I could handle about anything. Yeah, yeah, totally. Don't let it be a skunk. Yeah. And I open the garage door and I look out and I can't see. I had the trap set on the other side of my truck. So I walk around my truck and I look around the corner of it at that trap. And there is a skunk in there. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. So I go inside. I grab this old blanket and I hold it up from my hands in front of me as I'm walking. So all it sees is a blanket walking towards this thing. And I get up and I'm thinking if it sprays me, it'll hit this blanket. And I slowly lay it over this trap. And then I take, you know, grab through, through the blanket. I get the handle of the trap and I carry it outside and I'm walking along thinking there's a skunk in this thing, man. And I get it out there, and somehow I end up kind of folding the front of the blanket back, standing back behind where it won't see me, and I flip the door open, and the skunk runs out. And it just takes off. And I come back inside, and I told my wife, I says, I can't believe, I mean, it was a lot of duress. <laughs> I mean, I was coming up. Oh, yeah, totally. By this point, it's been a couple hours through this. And I said, I am so relieved to get this over. She goes, well, how do you know there was just one? And I thought, well, that's, I guess that's true. So I set the trap again in there and go inside. And about a half hour later, snap, I hear it shut again. Throughout the next 24 hours, we trapped seven skunks and a possum. That was all hiding in our garage in different areas. Uh, you know, I don't have one of those garages where you walk in and it's bare walls. I mean, I got kayaks stacked up, workbenches, tools. And I mean, you couldn't, you can't just go through it and find what's high. It'd take a while. But yeah, we had seven skunks and a possum that came into our garage to eat grass seed because we left the door open one night. So. We've made it a point not to make that mis mistake again. <laughs> but, yeah, we have marmots up here, and they like getting inside of your car where the engine is. It's nice and yeah. totally warm. But it's also like yeah. in the summertime here, it's like plus 30, plus 40 degrees Celsius, which is about a, uh, a little over 100 degrees and stuff. And I had this one marmot. And of course, you don't want them in there because they're like this big <laughs> and they like eating plastic or, or rubber. So you don't want them to yeah. destroy your motor. And the problem was this one. I opened up the trunk or the hood and I could see this face looking up at me because as soon as I opened the trunk, it was right there. And I went, oh, no. <laughs> then he ran down underneath to where the uh, scrape pan is on the very bottom of the engine, you know, to protect the engine from if you go over yeah. any rocks and stuff like that. So I couldn't get at it because it was underneath the motor and stuff. And, so I thought, well, I'll drive it into work, which is about, I don't know, 20 miles, you could say, into my office. And I parked in the parking lot. And I thought, well, it's like 100 degrees outside, plus it's in a motor. It's going to want to get out of here as soon as I take it to work. No, <laughs> it got out. I was watching it through the window. It got out, walked through the parking lot, ate all day while I was at work. And then it went back in. Or I thought I got rid of it first of all. 
And I got home and I could hear this chip, 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 chip. I look outside here, it's on the front tire. Like just sitting there, just suntanning and enjoying it. So I was in there for a week. I had to drive it for 45 minutes or I think it was over. It didn't want to miss its ride home. It did not want to leave. <laughs> We, a buddy of mine got together with me and we got a rake and I think it was a broom and we went when I was at, at their campsite and I said to Drake, I said, I think there's a, this marmot's been sticking my, well, let's see if we can get it out of there. And, you know, we were scared little school girls. It's just a marmot, you know, it's not like it's got bangs yeah, or anything, you know, but it's just, that's the same thing with you with, with the skunk. It's like, you just need one stupid move and you're you're you're, you're gonna smell for the rest of the week not to mention yeah having one done with and you got six other ones to deal with so but i just thought you know my life i live like like even up here we had i had a lynx come in and uh, or i think it was a lynx anyways and it wiped out three of my ducks and then there's been a cougar around and and uh the lady who takes care of the poultry she said to me there's a cougar and i said yeah he's been here since last week and she was all worried about the poultry and that. I said, we well, just have to secure, make sure all the animals are secured. I said, I moved here because I like wildlife. Yeah. I didn't move here because they're a problem. Yeah, <laughs> We're the problem in the environment. <laughs> we adjust ourselves to them. So Yeah. yeah. Oh, boy. Well, I got another video I'm going to show. This doesn't really have anything to do with wildlife. This is a, you ever seen these guys that jump out of, planes are off of cliffs with these wing suits on i know yeah. they're I kind of a that, suit man. that has a webbing from the wrist to the leg that they they yeah. catch the wind and glide on it like a and it's pretty high speed they play a lot of angles uh when they do this but this is something that this guy from china who's uh pretty he's one of the world record holders at different stunts he does in wing suits and I seen this video of him flying through what it's a mountain that basically has an opening that's 190 foot wide. That's like a keyhole. So it's like a tunnel, but it doesn't go a long ways. But in a wingsuit, he goes through this thing. And I, I can't tell you how crazy th I thought this video was. I'm going to pop it up and play it. Um. So this is him jumping out of the helicopter. And the first half of the video, I don't know how he does it. There is a, you can see the camera on his helmet. And so later on in the video, you'll see his perspective of it. But I don't see him holding out a selfie stick in front of him. But the first one is him head on. There must be something he's got mounted like that. But we'll play. he jumps Just, I mean, to talk about having to stay objective, you couldn't be subjective at all in this because you're going to emotionally freak yourself out. You it's so it. crazy. It looks like AI, but it isn't. Oh, it's, yeah. it's actually him doing this. It's a thing called Heaven's Gate is what they call this thing. Yeah, and they're flying, eh? Like, well, duh. But I mean, like, they're moving it so here he is coming down to this is his perspective and what's crazy is how low he is to the ground after he goes through it look at that look at that yeah just focus on the other side of the tunnel because you're gonna this. smash into the wall if you hit anything else like that i'm really that is I don't, I don't even get where somebody gets in their mind. Hey, I can do this. I, I would be. If, I mean, if your best friend came up and said, "This is my plan this weekend," you'd be going, "Don't do it, man." Yeah. <laughs> Just don't Have fun. <laughs> yeah. I'll be in the parking lot with coffee and donuts waiting for you. <laughs> oh man. So. But yeah, and then uh, so then the last video I had was. This is something that I think for people like me and you who kind of live in areas that have a lot of bears, um, I think that some of this is common sense. And then for other people, they, you know, they just don't have the experience of being around bears. When I share my encounter with people, 
And I tell them I thought that I was going to see a black bear, that I was on that game trail, and I'm watching all this dead fall and these cedar scrubs amongst all of the pines and poplars, thinking I'm going to see a black bear. And since it was the first week of June, I thought it could be a black bear with cubs. That's why I didn't just want to turn around and walk away. They're like, well, dude, that doesn't make any sense. You know, anybody would just run away from that situation. I'm like, "Eh, I don't think you understand what happens when you trigger a pursuit mechanism with a bear or a mountain lion or a lot of different animals. But this is a a video that... um, that uh, is kind of what you should do when you encounter a bear. I thought it was a pretty interesting video. Um, I'm not going to play the music part of it. I'm not sure if it's copyrighted, but. Probably. Fight urge to run away. And this is, a lot of this is true with mountain lions to make you big. You know. The difference is, is with bears, you just want to talk in a loud but soothing voice. You don't want to scream at it or yell at it. Whereas a mountain lion, you want to appear to be as fierce as you can. Back one. Yeah, no, that was, um, I think that's, like I say, I think for a lot of people in chat, a lot of people watching that, probably maybe that's common sense, but it's a lot of people who don't have experience with uh, with well, different types of wildlife. Try to use that's, yeah, and, but it might be common sense, but try it when it's happening to you. <laughs> You're, it's yeah. a little more tougher than completely oh, different. Common sense. Yeah, try to stay in a calm, relaxed state. That's another another story. So, yeah, that's and that's. I think that's something that a lot of people have a hard time analyzing or wrapping their head around when they hear other people's experiences, whether it's with wildlife or an encounter uh, with a Sasquatch. Is that they start thinking, well, why wouldn't you do this? Why it doesn't make sense? You don't under duress and under those type of conditions, it doesn't matter how well you've trained for something. Everybody, and you know this better than anybody because you you study human response and thinking and conditioning. And I, I write about this in the book. You know, when I was in the military, um, I trained with a squad of people. I thought we lived and breathed this stuff that, that under any conditions we will be able to handle no matter how dressful it gets. And yet when you find yourself in the field, in that position, out of those nine people in my squad, there's one, maybe two, that it doesn't matter that they've literally got thousands of hours preparing for this. They're in a ball. They're laying on the ground. They're coming undone. And, um, you know, it's a, that fight or flight deal. There's something that you go through your head and say, well, if I was in this situation, I would do this or I would do that. When you're in that situation, you're the way that your thought process works in analyzing, should I do this or should I do that, completely comes undone sometimes. Well, the more practice you have, 
then it's different than because you're going back to your primal brain. That's all where your defense mechanisms are, and that's automatic. So it's not like and you have to learn how to regulate it by using your frontal part of your brain to regulate your primal part of your brain. So it's not just you don't stay frozen when you should be fighting. You don't stay fighting. It should be fighting instead of fighting. Uh, and that's that, that's the tough part of when you're dealing with uh, uh, anything in the wildlife. I have a buddy of mine I talk about a few times. He's a, a guy, but his dad used to work in the he's from Canada, but he went down, I think it was in Vietnam. I, I, it was Canada it wasn't involved in Vietnam as far as saying, you know, we're against them. But a lot of Canadians went down into the service, it's American service. And he used to be one of these guys, I think they're called Gurkhas. He used to just lay in one spot for two weeks solid, one spot, and he would run his fingers down your shoelaces. If your shoelaces weren't done a certain way, he'd get up and flip their throat. And it, this guy was intimidating. He was he, like Cam's dad was like six three, just like he was a tough bush guy. Yeah. And one time they were up in the Yukon, and and uh, they went out hunting for uh, I think it was elk, or I think it was a, a caribou story. And uh, while they were up there, a bear came into their camp and destroyed their camp, like their tents and that. And he got so pissed off, he went over, and grabbed the hatchet, and went and tracked the bear down, killed the bear, brought the bear back. And it, you know, I'm just thinking, what, what do you do with a guy like that? You're like, what, you're not going to go get that. Oh, yeah, this, the bear's going to get it, man. <laughs> like, I just, yeah. Like, yeah, this is what we're talking about is, you know, you got some hardcore people that you might not understand that they, well, they should be more softer. But that's the kind of guy you need in the bush if you're in a situation. Yeah. Yeah. He's going to keep himself level. And you know, it's kind of surprising because it's not always that person who c carries themselves as to, you know, some people, the way they carry themselves, they kind of broadcast that maybe they're that person, right? Yeah, but I so. oftentimes, especially when I was in the military, I found out that some of the most probably capable people of handling these situations and thinking clearly, acting clearly and being very dangerous uh, to anybody they'd come up against are the kind of people that might be standing on the wall in the room, just kind of watching everything. They aren't peacocking around. They aren't carrying themselves around. It's just, they have mastered the ability to analyze the situation and figure out how to make it through it, you know, but well, I wanted to talk a little bit. Uh, you had mentioned last night on Nikki's show. Uh, Nikki, by the way, Harry, Harry Man Hoaxes and Hoodwinks had a great show last night um, talking about uh, if, if we get to the point where we prove that Sasquatch exists, um, how? what are the prospective changes in that and what might that look like? Um, as far as different things, I mean, we've seen how uh, an owl or a frog can change the logging industry <laughs> for uh, almost cripple it for momentarily, you know. And so, you know, some of the different things that would probably likely occur or could occur, there's a lot of speculation in that conversation. I get it. But, um, during that show, you had mentioned uh, towards the end how you've got some friends who are professionals at what they do. They are, how would you describe them? Well, I would call them friends because I, I don't know them as friends, but I've been learning from them because I do a lot of body language and micro expression in what I do professionally. And, and so they're, the, they're called the behavioral panel online. I encourage you guys to look at it. Uh, they teach courses on how to do it. And uh, I know Steve, I got Steve Culls in, uh, in touch with them or whatever. He started taking their courses too. And what it helps is when you're uh, talking to people and witnesses to help them figure out, you know, their story. Because a lot of times if you're, or whether or not you're being played by somebody who's trying to tell you a story about playing a Sasquatch. So they have done, um, and they're pretty fair guys. They're kind of the top, for people on the tier in regards to body language experts in the world. And uh, a lot of people are aware that they'll, like for me, people say, well, put them on Leon's hot seat, which I don't like that phrase because it sounds like I'm out to get people. 
but I'm not out yeah. to get people. I'm out to assist them to get more information and data from an experience that may, may be unknown to them that they bumped into so that they sure. can have a closure on that, right? And so these guys were talking about a year ago about wanting to do, because one of them, Greg, he's really quite interested in Sasquatches. Not sure he buys into them like that, but he always thought it'd be interesting. So, uh, and they do everything from UFO people to stars to, uh, you know, uh, anyone famous. They'll do body language, and what they do is they it's basically this is they show you what why what's going on, so you know what to look for in in a person when they're talking compared to when they're fabricating to, to uh, articulating a story, and uh, so. And also whether or not a person owns it or not. So anyways, they wanted to do a similar one, which what they did on their show before, which was in regards to uh, alien abductions. So they went and found people who claimed they had alien abductions and they did a breakdown of their body language and micro expressions on that. And the first one they did, they basically were saying, you know, this is what you're looking for. I don't buy this at the end of the thing. They'll kind of give an evaluation. But then they did another set of videos with a family who had an alien abduction. And that all four of them couldn't find anything deceptive about their thing. And that's a, that was curious to me because it's very similar to the Bigfoot online scene is you have a lot of stories. How do you sift through them? But these guys, because they're very well known, by the way, too, uh, that when, when they're putting their stamp of approval on somebody of not being deceptive, that carries a lot of weight. And that's what we kind of need, I think, in the Bigfoot community. So they were looking for... They were looking for uh, people recently, like right, right now, they're looking for people to uh, basically let them tell them their stories and they'll go through the body language to see whether or not it's legit or not. They did one, I think it was last year, on this one guy of a Sasquatch. Most of us, are, I think a lot of us know who this guy was and we already knew he was a hoaxer, but it was interesting because you can compare the two. Like with the alien one, you can compare the ones of people claiming, and then you got the ones where they 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 actually brought the, the family on to their show, which was the first, uh, because they believed them so much. And I think that's we talk about moving this forward. It's really hard in the a system because the system has sacred beliefs. In other words, the majority of the population of that system believe a story or a narration, but are scared if it's challenged, and that's your cognitive bias. Everyone has and, cognitive bias is my opinion about something. When it turns to cognitive dissonance is when I emotionally react to somebody telling me information that, I, that goes contrary to what I feel to be true. But we have to be prepared to bend the knee no matter what it is in regards to any topic. And so... And, I've heard that, you talk a lot about this lately and you refer to it as, you know, people start getting into these narratives and these beliefs that you start challenging their quote sacred cow <laughs> you know it's, it's not that you're really you're not really challenging anything you're just asking the questions like a five-year-old would ask a parent a question it's again the, the emperor with no clothes the five-year-old sure. sitting there saying he doesn't have any clothes on <laughs> which is a good question a five-year-old would ask which is real it's honest it's not deceiving. it's not out to get anybody it's just that i'm curious why is everyone seeing clothes when i don't see clothes this is a five-year-old you know like, mm -hmm. uh, and i think that the thing too that I've been really wrestling with, uh, which we will talk about when I about the conference I'm going to, but I want to start addressing lately too is the disservice we're doing to people who we truly believe have had an experience with Sasquatch because of what's online. Imagine being a person who actually bumps into a Sasquatch and then you are desperate to figure out what the hell that was and you sorry <laughs> what the heck that was where you no, come online funny. and you start to try to discover what it was that you saw. And after a while, after hearing the narrations of the ideas, these aren't facts, these are ideas, hypotheses of uh, formulations of thought of what people think is a Sasquatch, and you're not getting any information at all about Sasquatch. And that is causing a more abuse to those people who are already under a high-stress situation. And, I mean, my big thing is, what makes you into this topic? Well, it's not because I believe I've seen it a baby Sasquatch on the back of a moose, you know, I'm in the mental health field. That sounds crazy. You know, <laughs> what it is to me is that when I, I know people who have PTSD, I know the uh, look of a person who has PTSD. 
I, ha I know the difference between when a person has PTS from earlier life and they project it on to a present event compared to somebody who doesn't have PTSD from an earlier life uh, experience. And then they come across a Sasquatch and now they have fresh, brand new first time. You know, these are the ones who are, they go home, their blood rests from their faces. They can't sleep at nighttime. They're on medications for anti-anxiety meds and stuff like that to try to calm their system down. Those are the stories I'm interested in. And, and I, 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 it bothers me greatly that people like Jay and Joe and even yourself is there's this combat of everyone just keeps saying, uh, you know, this is what it is, but no evidence to help these people move forward. So with Joe, who wants to take a bit of a break, which I totally understand, and just go focusing online or focusing out in the bush of mm -hmm. Sasquatches, we can't even give him what to look for. You hear the narration, well, and but they're here. You, and they're there. you hear that in his voice. When I was watching, he had put a video up on, uh, just so that people understand, Western New York Bigfoot Investigation Group. He, he refers to himself as the Bigfoot Atheist. Um, he... He had talked about, look, I'm going to take some time away from scheduled shows so that I could try to find time to spend more time in the field. Because for a few years since his experience, he's been looking for answers and they are, these answers aren't online. They aren't. He's not finding them. I think he's would probably be the first to tell you that in hearing other people's encounters or, or, you know, maybe he's met some people and, and uh, derived some data from other people's experience that maybe he could um, relate to in some way or use to apply to understanding some of the things that he experienced. It still doesn't answer to him the things that he's looking to get answered. And so he feels why am I going to sit here online still trying to look for answers that I don't believe exist online? They exist out in the field and that's where I'm going to go look for them. Um, that's not somebody who's, I mean, that's a combination of one, it, you want the answers bad enough that you're willing to go out and get in the field and try to do what you have to do to get them. But two, it's a frustration that's being displayed that there's so many narratives out here and people talking factually about things that aren't facts. And it doesn't, as a realist, it doesn't satisfy my hunger to figure out what, ha what is this thing, you know? Well, and the thing too is his title. Like uh, it's, I don't know if you deliberately do this or whatever, but I look at it, I like setting up people all the time. So, but, but just by the name of big or Sasquatch, I think it's, is it the Bigfoot Atheist or Sasquatch Atheist? I can't remember because I'm kidding. The, uh, the Bigfoot right? Atheist but, Inquiry. Yeah, right. So when you say Bigfoot and say you're online and you come across a channel that's got that name. Oh, he doesn't believe in a Sasquatch. This is the point they're missing is he does. And not only does he, he's seen one and had an experience with one. The atheist part of not believing is the People, are, the narration that's online, not bad people, it's the bad system and the belief system that's in the system because no one wants to validate and vet. So we're, I, we're all hoping that this idea that with the scientific uh, uh, thing that uh, Doug's doing and stuff like that is going to give us data, information to help us track them down, find them, something that's real tangible, not more narration. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we have so much narration, we're drowning in it. You know, it's like, yeah. it's, yeah. it's not about that. It's about, you know, we will be here 50 years from now talking about a different type of Sasquatch, no evidence for any of it, but boy, we'll formulate a great one in our brain about what they might look like besides shapeshifters and portals. And they're here to save the world. And they, they're kind of a religious Sasquatch, you know, where, well, well they're here to teach us stuff. And, and only I can talk to them because I have a pure heart. You know, it's like, Mm -hmm. All these people have ideas and stuff, and they're they're it's meeting an emotional need for them. But is it factual? Because in the long run, it's going to cause harm to people if we're if you're deceptive about things. Or and it's not that you're trying to be deceptive. It's just that you're just going on with what everyone else is saying. So it must be right. Well, how do you know it's right? How how would you know it's right? Because they're saying it's right, and you're hearing it all the time. Scott from the behavioral panel, he thought he he jabs. Uh, Greg all the time about Sasquatch. So he thought, well, what I'll do is because he wanted to look into the idea of getting uh, 
people to share their stories to them, he started going to Sasquatch conferences, right? And so he'd take a picture and he has a picture of Greg and he'd take him to these conferences and this picture would come up. Oh, I'm like, so sorry you're not here, Greg. You know, sorry you're not here. And uh, so Scott says, after he went to these conferences, he said, he says, everyone believes in Sasquatch here. And and yet there's no one here that seems to seen as Sasquatch. And I said, that's like going into a church, Scott, and saying, uh, how many believe in Jesus? Everyone put up their hand. How many of you have seen Jesus? No one puts up their hand. You know, and it's not the right, it's not the right way of kind of going about it. And, and so I'm hoping that through what I've been doing research again, because I've studied what happens to someone come online looking for Sasquatch, but also as a Sas, uh, Bigfoot as a, a community, as a system, re- meaning that you get the same dynamics formula that you would in any system. It doesn't matter what's yeah. Bigfoot religious or any there there's always the people who are exaggerators hoaxers scammers people who are legit sincere but they're sincerely wrong maybe or, or and then they have the ones that small percentage of them where there's something here and that's what we want to find out is the small percentage we don't need a lot of chatter about what we think it is we need to find out that small percentage data because that helps the people yeah. who've been affected in some form or way you know so yeah, I think the church analogy is interesting because, you know, I mean, for those of us that identify as Christians, I mean, a lot of that is based on faith. But when you're going to apply the scientific method to the discovery of a species and the mapping of a species, you know, I I always kind of refer to as, you know, are you a believer or not? People like me and Joe and Jay we and you kind of, to some extent, got robbed of that ability to just mm-hmm. be able to make that choice. I mean, by default, I believe that I saw something and was in front of something and had this experience with something that most people who who would refer to it as Bigfoot. The only reason why I would call it Bigfoot is that's what cultures told me to call it. You know, I would I would probably come up with another name for it if had I had have no experience of, of reference for it, you know. But when it comes to establishing that science, I don't want to believe in Bigfoot because of faith. I mean guys like us who have had an encounter are stuck believing because we had an experience with it. But for those who haven't had an an encounter, but say they believe in Bigfoot, that belief should be established because of data that they've looked at or they've talked to people that they establish enough integrity in who had a firsthand encounter with one that they say, I, there's no way this person is not being honest about this or, you know, whatever leads them to that threshold of, of truth that they require to believe in something. It, it, it simply can't be based on faith, you know? Yeah. And again, like people in in the Bible, it says, you know, faith is believing the things that are unseen and stuff like that. And people use that kind of analogy, but the bottom line is that the fact of God is supposed to be a solid to people who are Christians. So it's not that it's a faith. It's a fact about the belief of God being real. And that should be the same principle in regards to the online scene. Again, I, I, I really hard, it's really hard for me as an educator to walk into a system, and it's a matter what system it is, and somehow change a huge cruise ship that likes the enjoyment of the festivities and the narration to keep the festivities connected with all the members on the cruise ship going this way but the bottom line is the topic is sasquatch it's not the ideas about a sasquatch that's parkinson's law of triviality is what's more interesting is the idea of what you're studying compared to the actual topic of what you're studying and that gets very confusing for people because if you if you have no answers, so Joe and Jay and yourself, you have no answers about this kind of stuff, and you come into the yacht <laughs> or the uh, great cruise ship, and everyone's chattering about it, and everyone's you're bonding and you're connecting up with people. It's a good time. You go to the Sasquatch dances or whatever, mm-hmm. and you start to mm-hmm. accumulate in your head. The problem with your brain is your brain gets confused with the experiences you're having in the community as being. Uh, a solid data sh- showing you that you should stay involved in the search for Sasquatch. And what would be better is like you were talking earlier, 
if there was a Sasquatch found tomorrow, once killed on the highway or something like that, it, there's no longer a question about a Sasquatch being real. Everybody who has ever thought, oh, well, it's always garbage, not, you're going to have every person on the planet. Well, I'm exaggerating there, of course, but you're going to have a lot of hard time not getting the public not to go in the bush to see one for themselves. Because that's what we do. We're just very, mm -hmm. very curious. Mm -hmm. And and that's that could be a very a dangerous thing well, to ourselves because you got all these crazy people running around the forest trying to find a Sasquatch. But it'll be a detriment to them as well. But that part is going to have to happen. So even if there is a body, there's going to have to be science involved to figure out, you know, what is the terrain they use so we can protect the terrain if it, it is affecting, if our logging are, is affecting uh, their areas. There's a whole bunch of study that has to be done. Then you're going to have on the other side of that lobbyists that are going to keep saying, nah, 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 nah. You, how do you know this? How do you know mm -hmm. this? They'll keep it in the forest as long as they can, probably for decades. And by that time, who knows, maybe they'll be wiped out. We wouldn't even know what they became extinct. But the key part is to really focus on, you know, if do we want to move this forward or don't we? Do we want to know what we're looking at or don't we? Do we want to help the Joes and the Jays and the Jeffs and the Leons and everybody else out there that feel that there's something here that we don't have an answer to? And do we want to stick with the facts of those answers instead of the narration of what we believe it to be? There's nothing wrong with having a hypothesis about something, but don't declare it as being a factual idea in your verbiage as you're saying it. Like mm -hmm. I've heard people online talk about certain philosophies they have, but they talk for an hour and a half about it as being a certainty in that tone compared yeah. to the 90 seconds at the end of an hour and a half saying, but I mean, well, what I know, it's just a hypothesis. Well, then don't declare it as, declare it as being a factual in your verbiage tone. Yeah. Ask questions so that the people at home can make join on I, with what, what you're thinking and, and expand i on. get that the people have passionate opinions and passionate positions on different ideas in this community but being able to present those as just that opinions or ideas versus a, presenting them as a fact is tough for some people i mean i saw it last night even in the chat on when Nikki had, I I think at some point that you guys had posted a map of a, of a, talking about that area X in Texas, and showing all the different spots that there was a, a sighting or an encounter, and somebody in chat says that map, you know, this is wrong. That map's wrong because these things aren't in. There are none of these things in that area. They're all on the west coast. And just stated that as a fact. And I'm thinking people don't realize how much harm they do to this community because people like me or you might read that comment and laugh at it. However, there are people that are on day one or day two of their journey of educating themselves on what Sasquatch is or what it may be. And they look at that and say, Oh, well, let me write that bullet point down in my notes. You know, it's just speaking factually about things. People don't get how much damage they're doing. They, they oh, really yeah. don't. Especially again, when it's wrapped in a package of it's a statement of certainty. When we're yeah. dealing with a topic that we're uncertain about, even the people, yeah. <laughs> this is what amazes me about the human mind, not people, but the human mind and how it works. Here you have people who actually saw one. Say they, there's one that one of those reports that were on that map, and someone was actually standing there seeing one. And you have these other people say, "Well, that's impossible." You know, like they don't even live there, and they've never seen a Sasquatch. It's just this conjecture that they think they know again. Then the Kruger effect was they just think they know much more than everyone else does. You know, I know everything. Mm -hmm. I know lots of great deep stuff. <laughs> that's why I'm pretty successful at what I do. But what do I know? Getting older at 59 is I don't know hardly anything <laughs> compared to yeah, what yeah. I, I really know. That's why I want to know good, solid stuff. Why do I want to? If any, and I think if anything, at maturity, probably, you know, as we age, it probably what really strengthens and develops is the ability to apply even more of a realistic analysis yeah. or approach to our life's experiences. And that's where that's we start pumping the so brakes a little bit and say, wait a minute here. Because what you want is a reality. I mean, for someone who's died nine times, like I have, 
it cut through all the BS in my life. I want to know facts of true things. Why? Because it mm -hmm. helps me stay solid in my own skin. Yeah. I don't need hypo. I mean, if you go into talking about the woo stuff, and this is my my angle on this one, <laughs> which I do believe is correct, unfortunately. Well, I don't know, unfortunately. But if, if I believe in the woo stuff, there's nothing tangible for me to hang into my reality with. It's all out here. It's all mystical. It's all, and it's called uh, uh, magical thinking in clinical terms. And I don't want to be magical thinking. But for 40 years of my life, I was in magical thinking, even though I'm in an adult mm -hmm. body. But I want to find facts. I used to think that, like a lot of people online, when you're looking at this topic, I used to find it threatening because I found it threatening against my magical thinking of what I was hoping to be out there and what I came what I came up with to somehow regulate myself to an unknown topic. But that will never work because it's not factual ad, uh, information about the unknown topic. And this is what we're talking about, the scientific approach compared to the scientific approach. Scientific approach is just ideas, uh, apophenia, and my thoughts of what I think about something. Those are just thoughts. They're just ideas. I know my wife loves me because she shows me. I sense it in my guts. She accepts me in my ambivalence, in my craziness, in my stupidity, in my moronicness, in my childishness, in my mistakes. She still loves me. That's solid. It helps me stay solid. If I get data where, you know, I think she loves me, I'm hoping she loves me, and I don't know she loves me, then I'm going to start playing games to make sure she stays with me to confirm that she loves me instead of her actually just choosing to love me. I won't even let that data in so I can relax in my own skin. And, and I think that's one of the detrimental things that come across people who have had an encounter with a Sasquatch or believe they have. And from when I've talked to, I mean, I've been doing this now for seven years online. I was doing it a lot before but it's a lot of times i've done a lot more interviews now i don't find very many people who i can say i would agree that uh, they have seen a sasquatch saying that it doesn't matter i have a handful of people that i know they saw something mm -hmm. and i can't I even think, use now that's own. an in, that's an interesting thing right there because this is something that me and you have talked about before something that you've seen often is that um when you're talking to somebody and they're sharing an experience that they've had with you, even if it's an experience now, I, I often say I have to keep in mind that because something hasn't happened to me, doesn't mean that it can't happen to you. Okay. So I'm going to be respectful of that. But when, it, when somebody sharing an experience or an encounter that they've had with you, and you came to the conclusion that because of the details or because of the way they're saying it, or maybe it's their body language or that there's embellishment going on here. I don't know how much of this is factual. Something weird is going on. But then again, you start looking at some people who share those experiences that even if it's something that doesn't fit in your box of belief that I don't know that this could have happened, you start looking at their body language and how it's affecting them and that level of duress. And you realize that even if that didn't happen to them, they believe it did okay. that they've well, gone that's through that's something that's brought that level of damage. The key part for you, if you're help, trying to help people with this thing, is to help them negotiate that. So a lot of times people might have experiences and they fought, believe it true to be the experience, but their definition they're using on it could be wrong. So an idea would be like if you're in the bush and you're a hunter and you're in your you know, you're just learning about Sasquatch and you hear about this thing calling being zapped and freezing and mind speak when you're in the bush. Then you ask people in the community, what are those? Tell me what those definitions are to you. And they'll say, well, I was paralyzed. I couldn't move. I was frozen. OK, well, like the, the, I no doubt all those things are true, what they're saying. But because they've been influenced by the narration that they've heard online, they project the narration of her, what they heard online onto their own personal event instead of the correct definition of what actually is happening there. So when you're in fight, flight, freeze, faint, or friendship, this is when you talk to a bear, you know, oh, everything's okay, bear, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Those dynamics are happening. 
But a lot of times they will appear if you hear a narration. I remember being in the bush four years ago and I'm thinking, I think this is what people are talking about. Really talk about being zapped, paralyzed. I'll just saw they're sending out their ultrasonic thing because that's the only narration they heard. And again, if you if you don't have information in your brain to know what you're looking at or experiencing, your brain has to go through all the files of your life experience till it finds something. If it doesn't find anything, then it's stuck. And that's the thing about when I'm listening to people say their story, I'm not expecting them to be able to describe the whole thing. They should be stuck. Watch Joe in this testimony. He goes like this. I don't know what it is. How many times have I asked him, Joe, what is it you're looking at? I don't know. See, that's yeah. stuck. That's his yeah. brain going into his head, looking through all the files. And look at, watch uh, uh, Jay. Uh, Jay. Both those guys, they're like synchronized dancers as you put them on at the same time talking about their experiences. Watch Jay and Joe. Both their eyes go up to the left and they're all back imagining. Of, uh, like they're actually, not, I won't say imagining, they're actually there, present. That's the other thing too is it's called regression when you're dealing with count in counseling. You try to regress people back. You're not regressing them in any stage. We do that all the time naturally with ourselves. We regress and we have these moments of trances. We go into driving down the road, thinking about something you did in the past. You go, geez, what a moron I was, you know? That's a regression. <laughs> Why are you you're going back? You actually feel what you did that was really stupid in the past. So that's a whole physical reaction to something that happened in the past. But I can tell by the physical reaction, whatever happened in the past, you probably felt that way because it shows right in your body. And your body is, again, you're, you have three brains and they're not connected to each other. So you can't think your way out of an emotional problem and nor can you think your way out of a, 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 a primal state. You have to reflect and take all your brains, all your feelings and all your emotions with you to regulate yourself to come back to a balanced state. Like, And you guys have done this. If you've been uh, dogs come up and all of a sudden he's being quite aggressive or a deer or an elk or whatever happens to be, you'll notice your shift inside yourself changes. You're very in tune with everything that's going on. You don't know what the hell is going on because you haven't really practiced that zone inside yourself. Uh, but what you're trying to do is, like you said, in the military is get that memory muscles activated which we have but we haven't disciplined them so as modern day people we had them disciplined you know, a thousand years ago when we lived in the forest and stuff but we don't have it now in our system it still operates in our system but we don't we haven't ever had to regulate it because you, know, you just come to your house i just get back in my car i just grab my gun i just you know i have all this security blankets i can use and that's not that's nice but it's going to cause some problems when you're you know, I want to know the truth about what people are saying. I believe people who sincerely have had an experience with a Sasquatch want to know the truth about what had happened to them. And mm -hmm. I think it's very, it's a disservice we're doing to them to keep a narration going of nice ideas instead of factual evidence. And I've mentioned this lately. I'm going to keep mentioning this down the road. There's stuff coming down the pike in regards to, uh, like I talked about when I first came online, don't throw any evidence away, any declaration of what the evidence is. Put it in a cookie jar, put it on the shelf. Let's open up that cookie jar, grab one piece of data, and relook at it today with new eyes. And that's yeah. been happening in a variety of fronts. And there's some sacred cows that I and viewers are going to have to decide and wrestle with, which we will, in regards to do you want to know the truth or don't you want to know the truth about what we're looking at? Because until we are open to that idea to be flexible, we can't move any situation. You can't move the ship and turn the ship. A ship doesn't turn on a dime. Mm -hmm. A little rowboat does. But if you try to change a community's perception so that we can find better solid stuff, it takes a while for that to happen. And there's two <coughs> things that will happen in changing the ideology of a system is a wave will come, clash into the uh, ideologies that are out there. And those ideologies that are out there, depending on the force of the system, if they want to stay in delusional thinking, will either wipe out the wave coming in that's trying to assist them, or this one will take over and eventually permeate, it's just like water, permeate all of the system. I think we're starting to see that happen right now. I don't know where the outcome mm -hmm. is, but conflict has to come. Conflict is a way of us organizing. Think of things with your wife or your husband. You have conflict with them because you're trying to figure something out. It's very important. That's sure. why you feel the energy of conflict. So, uh, and it's going to hurt some people, and they, uh, some of them aren't going to want to let go of their sacred cows. Nothing you can do about that. 
But the evidence is that. It's not my evidence. It's the evidence stands on its own. You don't have to, you know, I could yeah, you know, I, to it's an extent, <laughs> it's, it's interesting that those who are really out trying to collect data and analyzing data, trying to move the ball, are coming up with data that really does not move the ball at this point. But what's interesting is, is if this thing circles back, meaning let's suppose there is that body. Let's suppose that one does get hit by whatever on a highway in Washington state. And all of a sudden science is lined up to look and we're saying they must've been right. This thing is real. In comes the thousand questions. How many could there be? Where are there? Where aren't they? What do they eat? What don't they eat? All, you know, there's a that all that discussion. And yet all this data that we were collecting up till now or up until that point, which didn't move the ball, is now being re-looked at again. It's being reanalyzed. Look. There was evidence that it seems like this was here, but because you couldn't prove this was Sasquatch, we were telling you throw that away, it doesn't count. And yet now all of a sudden that it's mapped and we agree that this thing exists, we have to go back and look at some of that data that people were saying, well, that doesn't prove anything. Well, it might. If it, it doesn't, it didn't prove that it existed. But now that it's proven that it existed, if we reach that point, we have to go back and look at a lot of that data again and start re-examining it. What did it reveal? Well, I think we and, should be doing that now because the problem is if that happens, that scenario, you're going to have people out of the woodwork saying, we were right, right, right. And then they want to know where they, okay, so just for environmental, how, where, how do you find these guys? You're going to have all these dump trucks of people who mean well, say to the experts or the people trying to find the scientific remember we're talking about resources mm -hmm. so those people who are scientists are going to hear it's like the uav thing tell us if you've seen anything in the sky but they're going to just get dump chucks of dump chucks of all these people with their hypotheses and ideas of ufos that are coming in they have to sift through all that stuff that's what i'm saying is as citizen researchers that we're, we like to use that term and that phrase we need to provide them with that stuff if we don't have it, we don't know what we're talking about. That's the Dunning Kruger effect. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I'm talking about. I can say I know what I'm talking about, but if I can't produce it where you can come and, and, and say, hey, Jeff, I think I figured out where they're hanging. And then you, where you're at, do the same stuff I do. And you come across them and go, oh my God, Leon, I think you're onto something here. That, again, notice how you said that. Oh my God, I think you're onto something here. We're not saying for sure. But I have checked it with you. And then we got to Joe and we talked to Steve and we talked to Steve from CC and we talked to other people like uh, 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 Alex Pavanov, uh, or, uh, you know, monster, uh, you know, yeah. we'll talk about. But, we, we, but that's the way it should be done is we, you tell me stuff. I tell you, stuff, we start applying it. It seems to lead us closer to them. We don't have a, a radar. We don't even have a radar fix on them. <laughs> you know, we have a lot of ideas that are all over the radar, but it's so cluttered the radar that we can't even figure out which one we should be following to begin with. And that's what I think we're going to run into in regards to what science happens is there's going to be so much stuff on the radar from all these people now who feel now they're really important. They've never seen a Sasquatch, but they have a YouTube channel, you know, and they've been claiming all these things as being a Sasquatch. But if they were claiming it to be a Sasquatch, you would think over the years, especially if they, they, you know, they did see a Sasquatch and they are seeing Sasquatches and they're behind a tree, and that, you would figure out over the years how to get a clearer picture of them. Because that's what all of us would do. We would be sitting here thinking, how can I get a clearer picture of these guys? How can I film these guys? How can I figure this out? Well, they're so elusive and they're so magical. And, <laughs> they, they, you know, <laughs> they're going into these ex, 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 these definitions that are nice, but they're not valid. We are very curious as human beings. Matter of fact, we're so curious we can land on the moon. Remember, that only happened over 100 years ago, not even 100 years ago, right? And we landed on the moon. For thousands of years, we were looking at the moon. Now we walked on the moon. Holy smokes, that's a species. What other bug animal has ever done that before? None. 
Now we've been to yeah. Mars. Holy smokes. We've exited our universe with the Voyagers, you know, like, like the thing is, is I think in my mind, and I like shoving this one down people's throat is you are much more capable than what you know, but stick to the facts because that makes you even more capable of knowing. And you'll also be mm -hmm. able to detect the BSers or the stuff that is not valid and worth your time. And you can waste a lot of time in all this narration, but it ain't going to move you towards what the target is. We're looking for Sasquatch. Sasquatch. How do you find a Sasquatch? Not the depth. Not, uh, what do you think a Sasquatch is, Leon? How would I know? How yeah. would Joe know? Yeah. How yeah. would you know what a Sasquatch? How would anyone know? Well, and it's, know? It's, 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 if you think about this, if you back up like some of the analogies you're using, I mean, 20 years before we were ever able to travel the speed of sound, the, the talk of two scientists saying, hey, you know, a human traveling the speed of sound, everybody else would be saying, you know, dude, that's woo talk. What are you talking about? Right? Oh, yeah, you can't be done. And then two decades later, it does get done. And now we're looking at what can be the next step. The, wrapping your head around something that hasn't been done or hasn't been understood, at that point, Two decades before, if he would have said, what happens when a human travels the speed of sound? Somebody says, dude, that can't be done. And he says, well, it could be. People start asking him questions that he don't know the answers to. Well, how? How would you do that? He doesn't know what to tell them on how to do it. It doesn't mean that it doesn't happen two decades later. He didn't have the answers at that point. And some of the Sasquatch talk that it seems relevant in that way, in that we start looking at what's the most plausible explanation for something, or we start having these conversations, or we start trying to understand things, and people are asking how. They're demanding the hows and the whys and the whens, and, the, and th th those demands are out of place. We're not capable of answering those yet, you know. Any, I, I'm always open minded enough to have a conversation that involves some speculation. If we're going to realistically apply what's the most plausible explanation for something, not just what's the 113th most plausible <laughs> explanation for, and let's start there, right? Well, what I found because, was really fascinating was that when you, Jay, and Joe were on a show, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, and you guys started start talking about your experiences together. And you start talking about the skin color. Mm -hmm. And that's the dialogue we want to have with people who have witnessed the Sasquatch is you want to talk about, you want to hear watching those three guys talk about, yeah, 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 yeah. That skin was kind of like a gray kind of thing, a leathery kind. And you guys were fleeing off each other. Well, yeah, I thought, that, I thought that was interesting because I had it described it as the skin looked like dried dirt. Like it was just... Yeah. There was no gloss. There really wasn't right. a sheen to it. It really looked like dried, like the color of dried dirt that had cracks all over in it. And as I said that, I remember Joe saying, yeah, yeah. Like, like it just triggered this visual right there. reference. For that's him. right. And that's what we need is a landscape where that style of dialogue can be reproduced so other people can we get the data we need instead of the narration we're just hearing. And if, if I, I know, listen, I have a lot of hope for people in regards to studying anything and especially the unknown and the mystery. Uh, I'm not a negative Nancy, but I'm also a healthy skeptic and a healthy skeptic. You have an idea, but when a better idea comes up, you are flexible enough to bend the knee to it and let the data in. But it has to be something that makes sense contextual sense to what you're studying and and i i don't think people are like it's not that people aren't intelligent i think the problem is people like to act like not i have to word that very correct uh, correctly i think people want to know the topic and we're doing a disservice to the people who want to know the topic not even the ones who've just experienced a sasquatch by just keep pouring down them a narration because it's turned into a cultural thing now the culture idea of a Sasquatch is the narration we're hearing instead of the idea of the topic. So the cultural experience or narration of, of deer is like Bambi 
Oh, kumbaya. Like Nikki showed those pictures of, uh, you know, everything's very, uh, you know, like, oh, they're friendly. You know, rabbits are friendly because we watch Bugs Bunny. That's still imprinted in ourselves. And it does. It's a building block, unfortunately, of thinking this is how nature is. Nature is not moral. Nature is not ethic, ethical. There's cutesy things like a deer coming in and eating this guy's seed, which is that, that he's got out there that he's planting and stuff. The, then it keeps coming back. And that looks comforting. It's comforting for me to see a duck come all the way across to a lake to walk up on the land and sit beside me looking up at me like that. Why is the duck doing that? That's nice. But it doesn't mean that I want a, a grizzly to do that. Like you see those guys fishing up there in Alaska. Yeah. Know, and, 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 and they, they come and sit next to you. That's a little different, you know. I'm not going to by at that moment. I'm going to be really mm -mm. calm, relaxed state, not peaked state. So I can figure out what is the intent here of this animal that's sitting next to me. And because they're an animal, a wild animal, there's no moral or ethics. Uh something could go wrong in that brain and that animal and you're in big trouble so yeah it's like human beings i mean again human beings are a scary animal on the planet i i'm more concerned about bumping into people than i am of the unknown of an animal i Absolutely. wish i could predict an animal uh, that that human, that predict. was that was something that it's funny how you have experiences in life that draw like a realistic uh comparison to that i mean i always say over and over in the most remote places i've ever been whether i was hunting or guiding it was um it's not bears and it's not mountain lions that would be the worry me the most the biggest threat would come from another human being that had bad intentions and it was a few years ago that we had the deck door open on, on it, off of our back family room. The deck door was open. The screen door was shut. We have a cat. Um, and about 12, in the, about, about midnight, I was in my office. I had he headphones on, was working on something. And just for a moment, I took the headphones off, and I heard something like a hissing sound. And I walked out of my office into the family room, and I said, I, I was trying to figure out what was going on. My wife's laying on the couch and the back of the couch face was against that or faced that open door. And I said, what's going on? And she says, Jeff, Jeff, she's like whispering as loud as she could. That's what I ended up hearing. She says, what the F is on our deck. And for those who knew my wife, who know my wife, she does not swear ever, ever. And so when she's talking like this, I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, something is on our deck. And I said, how do you know? And she says, I can hear the cedar decking creaking. And then it like 10 seconds later, creak. She says, it's walking on the deck. And so I go into the room. We're, we're getting armed to the teeth. And I tell her, you flip the deck light on and I'm opening the door and stepping outside onto the deck, but we have to do it at the same time. She goes, wait, wait, wait. She goes, what, what, what if this is a mountain lion or something? And I says, I think it probably is a mountain lion. If you're saying it has that kind of weight to it. And she says, uh, well, what if it's a person? I said, Joni, if we have a person on our back deck, we have a bigger problem than if yeah, we have a mountain think. lion on our back deck. Yeah. She was worried about me going out there armed, and this could be a person. I said, if there's a person on our back deck, that's a bigger threat to me right now than if a mountain lion's out there. And that's really how I look at being out in remote areas. I, I would approach every human being neutrally, until they give you a reason not to per perceive them as n a neutral, uh, no threat. But as far as what anything would be capable of, nothing would be capable of being a bigger threat than another human being in those areas. But Yeah, there's nothing worse than somebody who smiles. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know yeah. And the smile, the smile is, I'm going to kill you and you have no idea. I'm going to play you for what you are because you're just property to me or you deserve to be, you know, abused by me. And that's, that's the scary thing about it. I mean, 
well, anyways, that's all I'll say about that. <laughs> Well, we've got about 15, 20 minutes left. Tell us a little bit about the conference that you're going to be speaking at. Where is it at? When's it, what's going on with it? Uh, the conference is in Merritt, BC, which is kind of in the southern part of British Columbia. And it was sold out three weeks ago. I think Sheldon was freaking out. He's the guy putting it on there from uh, uh, Nicole, Nicole Valley Podcast. He does a lot of... Uh, yeah, encounters for people to phone in. Yeah, I like him. He's a good guy. Yeah, and he's a good guy. He's a really good guy. And uh, but he's never done one of these things before, so he's like freaking out. And I just said to him, "Man, just relax." He, uh, the key, the most important part is just make sure all the tech works, the mics, mm-hmm. the overhead, mm-hmm. and the, the connections. And the, the, you've already got the audience because you're sold out. So that tells you there's a great thing for it. And this is just yeah. practice, so it'll be good. Um, there's a very toss salad approach of guests that will be speaking there. Uh, Thomas will be there. Uh, it's great to see Alex is coming up. I just messaged him this morning from small, or he actually sent me some pictures. He's on the coast. So right Alex Petikoff's going to be there. You're going to be going there with Thomas Steenberg. Yeah. Well, Thomas is yeah. actually going to be there. Jerry, the whole, our whole crew is going to be there. And uh, so I thought I was, you know, there's so much I want to help the community out in regard as a system. And, uh, you know, like people, they have a terrible tendency of thinking that I, I may be against the whole topic. I'm not. I'm, I'm frustrated about the lack of capacity because of the and it's not the people. It's the channel people that I am talking to directly, especially right now, is mm-hmm. if you don't have the evidence for it, don't declare it as evidence because it makes my life and everyone else who's doing investigating research harder to follow by not giving good information. So I wanted to do try to figure out, you know, how how can I assist that? Because it's such an eclectic group and that's going to be in the audience. So I figured out what I'll well do is talk about uh a cautionary note of doing research online because that's where it all sets off in regards to anybody in the audience. So my, my, the people I'm trying to reach are people who are maybe interested in the topic of Sasquatch. And, and as soon as you are, what sets you up uh, to be uh, kind of vulnerable, I guess, to the narration you're hearing online is, I, I ask about eight questions at the very beginning of the conference. How many, I'd like to see a hands. How many of you believe that you're fairly honest? Put your hand up. How many of you on, uh, fair, believe that you're fairly trusting? Put your hand up. How many of you feel that you're pretty uh, fair? Put your hand up. How many people do you think you're, uh, goes on to these eight kind of questions. And how many, and I s- end up with, how many believe that you're cur- you're fairly curious? Put your hand up. Now, the one thing that, that about all of us that sets us up into being uh, uh, not uh, prone to being influenced by a narration you're hearing online is your curiosity. If you're curious about any topic and you come online, you're going to be curious, which moves you down to your trusting. This is number two, which is inside yourself, which is your trusting regular because you're a fairly trusting person. I'm a fairly trusting person. Most people I've met online as people in the audiences are fairly trusting and they're curious about the topic. Then the next problem happens though, is you start hearing a narration. So right now you're looking at me online or you were, (laughs) so you're looking at a box, you're curious about Sasquatch. So somebody in the audience right now might be had an encounter or something where they're curious. So they came online. So the first thing you're they're hearing is my narration. And then the thing is you go online and what you do when you go online is you're stuck with certain things, the way the brain works. So you go online, you see a YouTube channel that has 50,000 subscribers. And uh, the last video you just see that it shows there, there was 40,000 views. So your brain likes patterns. So you click, your first click is on that channel compared to the one that has 596 viewers or subscribers and 300 views on the channel. And you click. And as soon as you clicked that, you programmed your feed in your on, on your community on your sorry on your computer to show you videos that have the same style of narration content to it. And so you keep getting this feed, and you think that that is what the general co- culture of that community, whether it's some big or hunting or anything, thinks and feels and believes about the system. And you keep getting fed that without realizing that's actually happening in your, in your, uh, automatically by the AI. 
uh, you're going to think that's the ideas that are out there that are actually factual true, but they're not. And there's nothing worse yep. if you've ever been on a hunting channel and you think that you, you bought into a guy who believes that, you know, he's a good hunter and he's got all these videos of showing him out hunting, doing all this stuff. And then you find out he's a scammer. He just never go into the bush. He just drives to campsites, but he has a backdrop of forest all the time. And, and then, but how are you going to find out whether or not you can trust these people? So there's a variety of different things I'll be doing because I, when I like teaching, I like to do a lot of mind games with people so they can see how vulnerable they actually are. Yeah. In regards I think, you, I think you actually have to set the exercise so that it becomes, people need to get in touch with that. And maybe they just don't naturally know how to get in touch with it. No, there I, isn't you're a right. Way think, to do it. You're right. You yeah, have to walk very, them through that. You have to yeah, you have to build the foundation so they understand from their inside out what you're talking about. I can be a lecturer because that's you know, you know, my era. It was about lectures. You just sat there and you like I lecture to you, lecture to you, lecture to you. Mm -hmm. I can't do that, but I need to have people be like I like being I engaging with the audience. I'm in it with you. When my one of my professors said, Leon, I can get you to Harvard or Oxford. And I said, I don't want that. I want to be in the trenches. In other words, I want to be sure that I don't get so high and mighty that I can't speak the language of the general population so I can explain to the general population about what the academics are talking about. That's why I like being dependent on academics. But I have to make sure what I'm saying from the academics is solid, not my idea of thinking it's solid. I have to go back to them and saying, is this what you mean by this idea, the woo? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now I understand the clinical reason for that. I'll help the general population understand what the woo is. And, and so when you're trying to help again, this massive luxury cruise line that's been going down, Oh my God, this is so fun. It's so interesting. I have all these friends. We're having a great time. Meanwhile, you have these people who are bailing off or falling off the sides of the boat and the cruise ship still goes. No one asks, where did so and so? Uh, where did they put Nobody the closes the buffet. You know, it stays you know, open. Why are all these people who we thought were really good people are no longer around anymore? <laughs> as they're too busy on the narration that they're being blinded by the effects of the bad information on the cruise that's making people fall off because those people can't pretend anymore. And this is the key part about people with good character. You can't pretend after a while. You wish you could. I wish, I, you know, ignorance is bliss. I wish I could be a moron like I was when I was younger, but I can't now because I learned the effects of being a moron and an idiot to myself, you know, it's like anybody, right? Where you don't do things that you did before. And so the key part for me is to help people take them through a kind of a mind trip of when you come online. So I'll, I have my first setup is kind of like, uh, I want to talk about that, you know, the kind of like the elephant in the room. You're talking to somebody, and I want to talk to them about my big fear. My big fear is, uh, you know, like, uh, my big fear is I saw a juvenile Sasquatch on the back of a moose in the middle of a lake. And what's my big fear is I don't want to sound crazy. Why? <laughs> because I'm in the mental health field. I don't yeah, want to have yeah. people think I'm crazy and that. So I need the context. So I explain about having to wait four years to, till the internet came on where it started showing other species taking care of other species that aren't their normal species. Matter of fact, they used to be their prey and now they take care of it. Like, so I have a whole bunch of pictures of different animals like that for context. So, but I'm moving quickly past that. And then I say, so you come online. So I have, you know, videos of your social networks. And then what happens? You click on one of those. And what do you click on? You click on what's called bait, <laughs> click bait. Yeah. Topics that seem interesting as you read them to the mind that somehow is familiar to your system that makes you click it. There's a force that makes you click it, and that is your priming of your your life experience. So whatever that clickbait says, you click on it, and then it clicks onto this channel. And then you run into these type of characters, these type of channels, uh, documentary channels, uh, entertainment channels, uh, uh, witness testimony channels and then you break that down into you run into those type of channels and then you also run into this is much more detailer when i get into it these characters so i have a picture that's the whole screen of about 50 people online everything from 
meldrum to ketchup to all these kind of things. And the, on each of those layers, I start saying, how are you going to navigate and negotiate whether or not these people are going to assist you in finding the problem? Now, these are taboo questions. Leon, you're doing taboo questions. Yeah, I feel I like you're taboo. setting me up here, right? Yeah, yeah. And I need, con you need conflict when you're figuring things out. Think of any conflict you had. It doesn't feel good, but you have no. to wrestle with it. Why is my wife leaving me? Why did my wife, husband leave me? Why is my husband doing that? Why is my wife doing that? Why did my friend, yeah. best friend do that? Why is my best friend doing this? There's a conflict that happens. We're not trained in conflict anymore. We run from conflict because it feels awkward instead of educating ourselves about feeling awkward states so that we can negotiate through those states because sure. there are, there's reasons for those states that help you grow up. And if you still have immature emotions that haven't developed in your body yet, your body's gotten older, but you're stunted in regards to your capacity. And that's what t those tools are supposed to be there for. So you can regulate yourself and, and see evidence and not be gullible and not be open and not be trust trusting when you shouldn't be. And and uh, But the idea at the end of the whole thing is I'm also going to show, look at what is a healthy skeptic and define that very distinctly. What is th three ways of knowing truth? You know, so people understand what I'm talking about. We always use the same word, but it has to be defined. So I'm trying to make it very, very simple. And then I break it down near the end about things to watch out for and things to do. And they're really simple yeah. things. But you're going to, the simple things are going to cause you to have a conflict in yourself because you're going to have to ask yourself, and I'm sorry, <laughs> which I'm not. Everyone has to ask themselves some pretty tough questions about yourself. Is do you want to know the truth about what you're looking at or don't you? It's not saying yeah. Sasquatch is not real, but don't take the narration you're hearing all the time of, as facts if they're not showing you the center part, which you guys heard me rag about hundreds of times, which is if they're not telling me, for God's sake, from the inside out, will you please tell me how you know that is a Sasquatch? Instead of just saying, that's a Sasquatch, tell me, educate me. And that's the key part. Education isn't about somebody attacking. It's about learning. I want to learn. I've made mistakes my whole life. That's why I learned. I think there's in this community when especially when it comes to the different um online sources of information that what happens is is you've got two different people try to lump these two markets so to speak into two categories there are those here who are looking for answers and looking for truth and looking for help and there are those who are here to be entertained. And really, the and maybe there's a lot that are caught in between those two groups, but primarily when I look at different streams and channels and things that I can tell that some of them are designed to entertain. I mean, the shock value of the titles of the shows themselves sometimes reveal that. And, you know, I, that's just a reality. That's just a reality. I mean, people will say, oh, you know, that's not fair. I, I think that's a real thing. But what happens is, is when one of the things that you had mentioned when you're talking about helping people get get through this process of maybe addressing some of the things that aren't they don't feel natural. They aren't comfortable to address. They're, um, I think about back at anybody who's gone to college or a university, and you start thinking about my who was your favorite professor. Usually it was the person who was able to take you on the journey of the learning process, who made it challenging but also made you realize i i can do this they they helped you navigate through it it wasn't just somebody who shoved data at you over and over and over and said digest it digest it it was somebody who made me realize there's different ways to approach these things and there and it makes you feel like I'm not just growing in knowledge. I'm growing in my ability to take a realistic approach to things. And um, 
Well, they give you they give you data that you go and you you wrestle with. People don't make up their mind on the spot, like as if you're having an argument with somebody. They have to spend some time by themselves, and in that time, you you kind of reflect on things. I think one of the things that's kind of confusing for people too is not understanding that. Look, if you're ever online, you are curious about something. That's why you're online. So you can watch all these channels we're talking about, and you're not thinking, "Well, I don't think that way at all." Well, it's because your first time you're you're starting to be online and you're curious about the topic, so you're hearing ideas now the problem with that is it stops as you get more curious about the videos you're watching and the narration you're hearing when you become curious what happens in your brain is it starts formulating a belief system and the more of that data you get into your brain because you're curious about it at the beginning turns into a faith belief about something because you heard it so much that there must be some factual stuff. That's not that you, your brain doesn't know right from wrong. You know, that's what your frontal lobe is supposed to be for is to help you understand. Take stuff. Is this a good choice or a bad choice? A lot of us said, oh, it's a good choice. Later on, found out that's a bad choice, you know. And But you have to pra- You have to give yourself some grace and patience and gentleness in understanding that I might be curious about something. Like, I am really curious about UFOs, Sasquatches, the unknown yeah. stuff. It's not, I'm not curious about that. I like mystery. I like the stories of ghosts and all that. I'm curious about that. But I don't take the hook, line, and sinker of the narration because I'm hearing somebody say, like a guy like Leon saying, well, this means this and this means that without any data proving, like, well, these are two real Sasquatches behind me. They're actually like more gorillas than they look Sasquatchery to me. But, you know, like, I, I don't, I, I'm curious about things and you want curiousness. I mean, that's why you have imagination. Imagination is what made us formulate ideas around a topic so we could actually learn to, uh, kind of reach goals in our life so we used our imagination how would we go to the moon if we we're going to go to the moon and so you had scientists wrestle with that with their imagination that's all healthy health healthy hypothesis and then at different layers of that they figured it out as they wrestled with it lots of mistakes lots of accidents have happened lots of you know it, it follies in the process of figuring it out that's where we are as a system every system's like that the thing is, we will stay in this irrelevant zone for the next 50 years if we don't kind of try to up our game. I think one thing I appreciate about Doug's um, stuff he's working on right now with that new, uh, sorry, my brain's glitching on me a bit, with with this, uh, what's the legend meets science too kind of thing. Yeah, we, yep. we want good ideas out there. It's not that we're necessarily going to be right and dead on, but we want the idea of a landscape around us that gives us an opportunity to think differently. Notice I said think differently. That doesn't mean I'm closed minded. I just think differently. But if it, we're going to put if we're going to put stuff into the playing field, that landscape, we want to make sure it's as solid as possible. So others looking at the landscape, the fort that was in the pool or the ring have something tangible to work with, not just idea. An idea is free floating. It's up here. Oh, I can't see it. Sorry. I think, it's I think here, to, you know? it's to down draw, here to, so. to remove, I mean, to try to draw a, a, my perspective on that is this, and, I, and I've been, I've never really hid this approach to that I take uh, with, with others. I try to be very open when I share it, that when it comes to Sasquatch and uh, any field work, research, anything, I try to approach it. I have to find a threshold that I start from that feels as real and as solid as I can start from, I want a good footing to be starting the approach. That doesn't mean that I, I have to, I can't be biased in how I approach the data. I have to follow the data and follow that where it takes me. And if I start from a flesh and blood approach, because in my mind, that is in my mind and experience, that's the most secure spot to start from. That doesn't mean that when I'm looking at what's the most plausible explanation for something, I start considering things and I talk to others and say, what would your perspective be on that? That if I'm following the data, it may lead me to a position where if I looked at that from the starting point, I would have probably said, that's not a good spot to start from. But if that's where the data leads me, that's where it's going to lead me. So, I mean, things that 
Some of the things that, and I hate the word woo because I think it's kind of rhetorical the way it's used by a lot of people, but there are things that I look at that, when I consider explanations for different data and different things that I'm trying to consider uh, as it relates to Sasquatch. And it comes down to the fact that if I said, I'm only going to take the flesh and blood approach and I'll never look at something that goes beyond that. I think that's, I don't, I think that's a pretty biased statement to make. I have to consider where the data will lead me. And I don't know where it's going to lead me. I I have to work as tenaciously to disprove a hypothesis as I do to support it or build value in it. And so I don't know. That's why when people say, like you brought up earlier, Jeff, what do you think uh, Bigfoot is? I don't know, right? I, I stood in front of one. I watched it again walk out onto a beach. I still don't know. I, I I almost draw that. I almost revert back to the whole human versus mountain lion. What's the biggest threat? I, I kind of look at that and say, I'm open to the idea that Sasquatch isn't real. However, it presents a bigger perplexing problem to me. How does a human get that size, that body mass, and survive without shoes and clothes and all that stuff, I, 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 that's going to lead me down an even bigger realm of understanding what, I'm, what I experienced and what I was looking at. But right now, I have to look at that flesh and blood approach and say, I'm going to start by saying, I believe that this is I don't like talking about the origin. Just I, I know Joe's uncomfortable with that too. He's got ideas of 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 if I was to find which slot does this fit into, so to speak. Um, but yet I have to be open minded enough to understand that what if we get a body tomorrow and we put it in the slot that it fits in. It may not be the slot that I originally started thinking this is where it fits. And I have to be comfortable to accept that. And and like the words that you use, I have to be willing to take the knee and admit I was wrong on that approach. I, I, I thought it was something different, you know? So I think that's good when you're speaking the way you're speaking and about the things you're speaking at, at this conference and, and, because I think it helps people understand the realism of the challenge of getting these answers and where we have to look and where we shouldn't start looking. That, that's an even, that's almost more important than where we should start looking. It's where we shouldn't start looking. But yeah, um, and the key thing for science, the science investigation, and people get this all wrong. It's like science is out to prove everything wrong. No, science is out to prove itself to be wrong. That's what science does. When it can't be wrong, <laughs> then what you're stuck with is the evidence. The neat thing about real good solid evidence, you get there very quickly. Everyone can get there the same information very quickly when they hear the great correct evidence about or the correct data about the evidence. Like if I know what car works, how do I know what car works? How do all you guys know what car works? We all drive cars. So we know the yeah, facts yeah. of the evidence. We don't understand how a car works all together, but we do know what car does drive us by put a key in it, yeah. in ignition and move forward. So the idea about any kind of valid evidence, again, when you're looking at things is you want to find out what I'm looking at. In order for me to find out where I'm looking at, I got to get out of my parameters of my brain of my box that I'm in and look outside of the box by asking me the right question. Like, Prove to me it's not a Sasquatch. Or right, prove to me it is a Sasquatch. So I have to go through all of the list to prove to me it's not a Sasquatch. And if I can't prove that and I'm stuck with something else, then I have to figure out, well, what the heck is this? Then yeah, I can talk yeah. to people who are more knowledgeable in those areas, especially whatever happens to be the evidence I found, to go and ask them questions. You know, like I do want to know about people, not because I'm looking to find people as being like, I'm not out in the vendetta to prove that Sasquatch and these people are liars, but I don't want to waste myself, my time or your time. If I find out that somebody is being deceptive and not telling good information, 
the information is the data. It's not my opinion about it. It's about this is the data. This is the information. You get to go and do whatever you want to do with it. If you want to look for a Sasquatch, again, the key part is, remember when you started this, you were curious. And then you moved down a level of different types of shows that pique your curiosity more. But you're also picking up a narration in the culture of those shows, especially if they're entertainment shows, of an idea of the topic. I think most of us, in regards to any other animal we've come across, whatever we thought at one point they were, we were totally wrong in regards to how they actually exist. And I think that's what we'll find about this. If we run into one and come across a body, that will be the beginning of asking us real good, solid, great questions. And most of the stuff about flying out the window in regards to it's just narrations and 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 you'll see and people will be able to let go of it because they realize man this is that was crazy <laughs> so let's yeah. let's bypass the crazy part and just stick with the factual parts so that <laughs> it's helpful for the scientists down the road if one is found on the side of the road dead or hit by a car which i don't hope for but you know it, it would certainly give us a lot of data that we need for to start with for a starting point so yeah, you know, and it, one of the interesting things that Thomas had mentioned last night on Nikki's show was, I think, I believe it was Grover who who had Grover Krantz had said, "Look, if if one or two of them dying occurs in order for us to understand more, if that was detrimental to ruining the population, they were going to be ruined anyways. They weren't going to yeah. survive, yeah. you know, the one hit on the side of the road." <laughs> But it, you know, I mean, that's something to consider. I mean, I, I know there's a lot of people that look at this and say, I don't condone shooting one. I don't condone that. I don't either. But in the same aspect, if you found a body and that one body means that one tenth of their population is now gone, they weren't going to survive. <laughs> there's got to be thousands of them in order for it to even have an opportunity to uh, to be protected and, and survive. So, well, Leon, I appreciate you coming on and joining me this morning. I do have one question. Are you going to be able to video your talk at the conference so that later on on your channel or on a different channel, you're able to share that presentation or are they not allowing that? Well, no, I, I'll be mentioning that if any of you are trying to record me speak, don't even bother to try and put it on a social network pro, uh, platform because you're going to get copyright strikes like crazy. Not because I'm sitting here, oh, I want all the information. No. It's because I want to make sure that, like, uh, Jerry is going to be videotaping what I'm talking about. I want to make sure that people, uh, when I do it, I have to include the videos I showed because, again, it's very I yep, yep. systematic layer it so that people get a good... You know, and I use a lot of humor in what I'm doing, too, when I'm talking. And I haven't taught, like, for a while because of COVID and then the instant, my physical. Sure, uh, sure. Medical stuff. So it's going to be good practice for me because I like interacting with people and I like. Doing yeah. Well, I was just stuff. wondering if you were going to have, like, if Jerry films it and you guys put it on uh, your channel, if that if that's something that people will be able to find it and reference. Well, we hope so. Yeah, well, that's the idea. That's the idea. So it's I, I'm pretty sure like Sheldon, he's not too familiar how to do any of this kind of stuff. And so I've, I've hosted quite a few functions like this. So I'm not. Yeah. Uh, to me, it's not scary to me. It's like, you know, just relax, buddy. You're practicing. You know? Yeah, I remember talking to Sheldon. I shared my encounter on his show. It was one of the first ones, his and Brian King sh Sharp show. Yeah. But um, Sheldon just really a, a nice guy i mean just genuinely a nice guy oh yeah and i would hate to see anybody you know i think that he's got enough people around him that no matter what challenge that having a first conference like that may bring he'll figure out a way to navigate it so yeah well it was kind of funny i talked to him last friday and he was just, he was doing uh uh the cbc which is the broadcast corporation were doing an interview about the conference with him and so of course it got out on cbc and stuff like that and then he said he got this like three-page letter or somebody just pissed off right at him saying 
How come you're having a Sasquatch conference and you're not having a conference about Jesus and how he saved the world and died for your sins? And the guy just is going on cutely in this. And I just said to him, you know, that's the problem is you come out here and you try to say anything about education, about this topic, and and that it gets to be so volatile in a variety of friends you don't even know about. You know, it's like, what are you talking about? We'll have a conference about Jesus if you want to. Like, what what are you talking about? You know, like, yeah, I just I, I would challenge anybody who to come up with one thing that could be talked about anywhere that won't have anybody getting in line to have a problem yeah. with what you're talking about. You can't come up with So You're always going to have people that are <laughs> pushing the opposite direction, so to speak. So, well, good right, luck with the conference. Too. I'm Thanks, excited man. to hear about it on the backside. You can come oh, tell yeah, me totally. about it later yeah, on. Me too. <laughs> but uh, if you want to stay backstage for a minute, I'd love to talk to you for sure. a moment before you go. Sure. Yeah. Well, I appreciate everybody joining. Hey, I get you know, listen, coffee time where it's going to be a different flavor some weeks, right? We, we, it's not always black with no sugar and cream, okay? Sometimes, uh, well, I'm not a fan of pumpkin spice, but uh, you know, you're, you're going to get some different perspectives brought forward on the show. Um, me, me and Leon both kind of operate in the uh, I would say the a flesh and blood approach to Bigfoot. I understand that not everybody has that. Not everybody starts with that. Um, there will be coffee time shows where I have guests on that we're talking about something I'm completely unfamiliar with, but I do have an interest in, or I'd love to learn more about it. Um, and so you know, uh, for those who, who tune in, I, I want you to know, I, I find a lot of value in Leon and the way he approaches things and his perspective on things. It's one of the reasons why I dedicated a whole chapter of my book to really getting his perspective on this. So not only on the subject, not only on the community, but especially on those who have had an experience and how they deal with it and what kind of an effect it has on them long-term, short-term. Um, and I, I just thought so much of what he shared with me that I put in the book was really profound. So um, that's why I wanted to have him on this morning. Appreciate everybody who took the time to hide from the boss and, and uh, look like they were busy at their desk to join us here. And um, tonight, Nine o'clock Eastern on Pine Island Research. Uh, I've got a great show coming up. We're going to talk about the Sutton Pass area and some of the things that have occurred there. Um, but I, I, I encourage you, 9 p.m. Eastern, come back here to Untold Radio and check out Pine Island Research tonight. Um, on your way out the door, feel free to hit the like button and subscribe if you haven't subscribed. For those that are listening on the many, well, all of the podcast platforms that we broadcast from, um, I encourage you to also check out the YouTube channel at some point uh, when you have time and, and give us a subscribe. We'd like you to follow us on YouTube too. Many of the things we talk about on the show are, are videos or pictures or in, involve a visual, so to speak, that you just don't, you kind of get robbed of when you're listening to the discussion on podcasts. That doesn't mean that you can't enjoy the show. We try to describe the things that we're looking at on a video uh, when we're sharing a video, but it may give you an opportunity at a later date to once you're back home that evening to go back to YouTube, click on the channel and, and then take a look at those things you were hearing about. So we invite all of our podcast listeners to find untold radio network on YouTube and give us a subscribe. Also those who have any interest in wanting to see eventually the legend meet science Two documentary. I encourage you to just go ahead, click the Kickstarter, donate $30. All you're doing is you're prepaying the $30 you would have paid for the documentary to put it in your library up front. It's going to help uh, Doug and his team reach their Kickstarter goal so that they can get this thing done and everybody can enjoy it. So 
Until tonight, I will see you guys later on and have a great rest of your Monday. Thank mm -hmm. you.